There have been stories everywhere throughout history that I was going to start and refer to. A lot of them I could point out as being the beginning of man's yellow circuit development. From the religions that most of you would be more familiar with, the Western religions of Judaism and Christianity, like from the Old Testament of the God saying, uh, or the book saying that the gods were the word, and that that was the secret. You could look at that not as some story that remember that came from external sources, but from that which came from man's own nervous system a kind of memory put into words when memory did not have words, DNA speaking in a language wherein it originally had no language. And so the idea that the guide says, awaken, be intelligent, have a soul, etc. You could see that as being absolutely the ignition, the development of man's jealous circuit nervous system. But I want to point out another aspect tonight, that which is of most interest to most people immediately, what seems to be the feelings again. I'm going to give you a variation to describe something else, and although this is two-dimensional, this is right on the money. Of my, remember, hierarchy of the circuitry, But in this case, I want you to consider it in this manner. This should be right in the center of it would be the to draw here is this. I could take some of the other stories just as fast as I could think about them. Like, how about the Great Flood, which is not, as some of you may know, limited to Christianity or the Old Testament. Stories all over the world. In one sense, you could see it as Noah and these other stories that this group of people, fairly uncivilized, which is in all the stories is why the gods were mad at them, that you guys won't straighten up, you won't listen to us, you won't do like you should do, and therefore we're going to flood this place and let a few of you survive. They come out of the ark more civilized. (laughs) But between all these stories that you could see in the Hindu story is a man being dust and that the gods in some way go wham and they spring forth and they can talk and they can see and they can move around. Well, you can move around and you can feel animal passions without an intellect, without yellow circuits. It is true that as far as the 3D reality of here on this planet, that it can truly be said that what makes man singular, assuming you're past the childish stage of worrying about your immortal soul, as I think you people used to call it, it is the yellow circuit. That's the only thing that makes you unique, that and having a charge card. (laughs) Other than that, it can truly be said that you are no different. This is not exactly true, but since I'm pressing on with this, it could be said that you are no different than an orangutan or a newt or a water buffalo were it not for the yellow circuit. But... Let us refine it, and I can put it still another way, as always. And I can point out that, in a sense, what people call human emotions, and what I'm going to refer to tonight as the blue line sphere of influence, this is even the blue line battleground. And it is this area that I have drawn in in green, this jagged area, that there would be no yellow circuit. There would be no intellect were it not for this thing that almost doesn't exist, and that is human emotions. A few people have been around a long time, I say it hardly exists. Uh, That's sort of a little non-inside, non-joke joke joke I make. 
of almost denying that there is such a thing as human emotion. Now, there obviously is. But for the sake of anything profitable, for the sake of doing anything extraordinary like this, is why I somewhat with my, is it my cheek and my tongue, or my tongue and my cheek, or my hand in my pocket, of saying there is no such thing as human emotions. So tonight I'm going to try and point a little more specifically as to why that can be said, not just by me, but why that can be said. The yellow circuit, human intellect, could not exist the way we are situated. If it was simply springing from the red circuit, if it was simply springing, as ordinary people would say, from the life of the body, from the very parts of your existence that you have in common with the higher primates, let us say, it could not be a direct jump from that to the human intellect. There is a kind of segue in music. There is a kind of bridge in philosophy. It's been referred to not in the way I'm talking, but about there being a kind of bridge in man's development. But what the bridge is I'm pointing to specifically at night is what other people call, what ordinary people call human emotions. And the nervous system in you, all the DNA in everyone, has some recollection of how it is to be subject to passions of the body as opposed to what you call human emotions. Even our legal system throughout the world, not just in this part of the country, this part of the planet, takes into account such things as homicide, that is murder, and premeditated murder. All over the world, out in jungles, throughout the known history of man, there has been, and don't look at it as being the society recognizes the difference, it is the cellular basis of humanity recognizes the difference of someone maybe getting a few drinks, been out and they had a good hunt, and they almost got run down by a lion themselves, and they escape, and they walk home, and they walk in a tent, and there's their wife rolling around the dirt with their neighbor, and they stab the guy and kill him. That is not the same thing as finding that and going out and waiting two or three hours, waiting behind a tree on the guy, and to think about it and to plan his murder. They see it as two different things. What they're seeing is, in one case, that you have not gone through the process of going from the lower red circuits into the bluer circuits. You bypassed it when it comes to premeditated murder, and you went out behind a tree and you tried to figure out the way to best kill him, to most efficiently kill him, to perhaps kill him and not get caught. And that is more culpable, that is more to be more forbidden than it is for simply the red circuits to be overcome and to kill somebody. And then go, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this side of murder, all of you are familiar with this. It has a different feel to it. It has a different tone to it. For you to turn on your children if you had a child, or even your dog, or your kitty, or a friend. You walk in the room, and a child, or a dog, or somebody does something, and you go, God damn it, leave me alone a second. They ask you, what time is it? Are you, can you carry me to work later? But the dog barks, and wants to go out, and you just got in the morning, you say, all right, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then you won't say, uh, hey, I'm sorry. Let me get myself together. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. I'm sorry. As opposed to that, then if you had been sitting around rehashing something that your child had done, or your mate had done, and waiting for them to get home, and you keep replaying, well, all right, when she walks in, I'm going to say, God damn, you did so-and-so again. And then maybe you do it, and the, person, the other person goes, ah, and they apologize, or something happens to where you feel the need to go back and apologize. So, well, maybe I shouldn't have done it that way. I'm sorry I put it that harshly. It has a different feel to it. Even if you go back and verbally say, hey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have talked to you that way. It has a different feel if you have been sitting around plotting it and rehashing what it seemed to be the basis of your complaint about the other person than it does if you just walked in the room and they ask you something and you go, hey, damn it, leave me alone a second. And you go, oh, I'm sorry. It has a different feel. The reason it is, is one of them, one of the cases, comparably, relatively speaking, springs more just from this. That is, just walk in the room, and you just got up, and they, somebody says, you, can you carry me to work? I'm running late. And you go, damn it, leave me alone. 
Now, of course, you cannot isolate. This is all artificial. You cannot isolate any of the circuits by themselves because the yellow circuit is in operation or you couldn't talk. You couldn't say, damn it, leave me alone. Well, I want you to understand it almost goes from here right to the tongue and the lips. It almost bypasses the blue line, this area of blue's influence. It does not get filtered into a more civilized, a more humane mode of behavior, mode of speech. It is in this jagged area. Can everybody see? I don't know how it's showing up on the camera. I've got the yellow circuit up here. This jagged area, I didn't just draw that. I drew it a specific way. But you notice it encompasses the heart of the blue and part of the red and the yellow. It is in here, without them knowing my diagram or my description of it, it is in there that ordinary people speak of the unique human emotions, charity, compassion, romantic love. It is there and only there. But notice this. I drew this specifically. There is an extreme area in the yellow circuit, an extreme area in the red circuit, that the sphere of the blue line does not touch. It is only in here that people experience what they call emotion, as opposed to animal passion. Because they certainly, they certainly, you or no one, experiences those kinds of human emotions such as mercy, charity, pity, sympathy. You do not, you or anyone, you do not experience it at the extreme of the red circuit or the extreme of the yellow. It is only right there. It is right there at the blue line in the sphere of its influence or the blue line battlefield that it could be referred to as being the source, the entry point in human life of emotion, not passion now. when I'm, I'm not trying to play with words, but if I say passion for the rest of the, my comments tonight, I'm referring to that, which would be, if we could isolate it anymore, it would be these feelings coming from here, passion, not emotion. So remember, I'm referring to if we truly had red circuit behavior coming from humans. Now, it's nothing strange. It's the only people talk about emotions of animals. Let's leave out domesticated animals like dogs because they almost dance with humans. But other animals, lions, you can watch a nice one geographic or you can read a book of someone who's lived out with animals and they will try and talk about the emotions at times. They'll use the term the emotions of the mother lion to the baby lion or the emotions of the leader of some pride of lions, it seems to be one old male's, they'll speak of his emotion toward an upstart young male. There is no such emotion. What they mean is passion. It cannot be affected. That's why they can't be domesticated. It has no compassion. It is truly, and you should be able to hear this, it is truly separate from what humans ordinarily believe that they mean when they talk about emotion. Is simply animal passion. All right, if we could chop up, if we could split up humans into separate functions of these circuits, which we cannot. I can do it talking to try to get you to look in a certain way. But if we could, then be down in this extreme area of the red circuit, we would have passion. Blind passion would not talk, has no mercy, doesn't give a damn about anything except keeping itself alive. But then, it gets up into here and it starts becoming what? It starts becoming what I could refer to as the ark. The civilizing influence of lower circuit passion, which made it possible, in a sense, for the yellow circuit to develop. Now, historically, if I recall my days in high school, yes, I almost finished high school, that there have been people that pointed out that the saving grace of, or the impetus that carried humans into a civilized mode of behavior was the development of agriculture. So if they didn't have to keep roaming around, they could stay in one place and go come quiet and stay there all year. <coughs> you can say that. You could say money, charge cards, all kinds of things could have been looked at as the basis of civilization. I can tell you the basis, though, of civilization was the blue line. It was only that. 
Without that, there could have been no civilization. You would not be civilized. We would not be sitting here. We would not be dressed. We would not be housed like this. We would not be talking. So, even though for the sake of some other comments, I could uh, go along with saying that agriculture was the basis of human civilization. Or it was one of the developments without which civilization would not take place and we would not be standing here clothed, fed, and etc. But can you see, whereas that would be a kind of first story that life puts out, that agriculture was absolutely necessary. And that's what was the basis of giving man time to develop the intellect. They could stay in one spot and grow food and not have to hunt meat all the time, could start growing vegetables and stay in one place and grains and had time to sit around and go, hey, I'm having a what is this? And he called it a thought. <laughs> all right, I could say that. I could use that. I'm not saying that that is a view. That's the way the things work in the city. But do you hear me? Without the passions, the extreme passions, the red circuit, without them being calmed down, without them being filtered, into something more civilized, that is what was absolutely necessary for the intellect to take place. It is only up here in the yellow circuits, still within the sphere of the blue line. It is up there then that people can write about charity, about love, about companionship, about religious matters. That not only the passions, the crude, I always remember nonverbal, if we were actually, if, again, if we could divide it up right now, artificially, and turn somebody just into that, they could not speak. Your passions would be, you would not ask someone, hey, would you share your potato chips with me? You would knock them down. You'd kick them. You'd take it away from them. And not just playing some strong, silent type from a movie. You simply couldn't talk. You couldn't ask them for it. You wouldn't want to ask them. You couldn't ask them. You see it, you'd grab it. It has to be filtered through this blue line area for it to turn into what constitutes much, much, much of human literature. You could say that constitutes, if you can follow this right quick, it's of no particular importance that I'm going to point tonight, all fiction. All writings of a religious nature all odes and comments to romantic love, all commentaries, references to charity, mercy, can only arise in this area of the yellow circuit, this verbal, literate, but the part that is within the sphere of the blue circuit, the blue line, Now see if you can jump this far. Even though I say, quite materially so, that it is not profitable, it's not possible to profitably cut up humans, physically or otherwise, into these parts. It is too interconnected. You can't have one without the other. You cannot simply cut off let's say the red circuit, which I've already pointed out even to you new people, if you can hear that, that is very common among so-called spiritual peoples. That part of life's body that seems to be spiritual, they continually, throughout history, badmouth the body. The last time we met, I was even pointing out some of the reasons why. But they attempt to starve the body. They attempt to uh, do away with sex. They go, ooh, it gets your sheets all yucky. And, you know, it's, it's, it's embarrassing to, for, for me to have a picture of me being a holy man and get my beard grown out good. And since this one girl I know put up a mirror on the ceiling, I get a glimpse of where you're thrashing around the bed. And, you know, that is not spiritual. <laughs> well, enough humor. They continually, continually are driven to speak as though, hey, the thing holding me down to planet Earth, the thing keeping me mundane, and sinful, and away from higher expectations and 
realities of other worlds, other realities, is my old damn body. It's just always giving me trouble. You cannot split up a human, but what I was going to point out, I specifically, I know what I'm drawing here, I'm the one that's doing this, there's an area here, and an area here, wherein my blue line sphere of influence has not touched. It exists, and it is reflected again through man's DNA, through his own cellular structure, in such matters as this. Let me bring it up to date. I assume all of you, at least from reading, are familiar with the idea that's been around, especially since the jogging and running craze took over, let's say the last decade, there's been this idea. Even psychologists are now dealing with it. The possibility of a kind of transcendental experience through exercise through running, running to the point you can't run anymore, and you meet this brick wall that you're, now I'm going to change back and forth from their kind of terminology in the city to what I'm talking about, a parallel, a more complex. It's like you run till you have drained the red circuit down in here. You've run past the point of worrying, let's say that the best you can do, just the way your red circuit is structured, the kind of energy available to you, that the most you can do is run five miles at one time, let's just say that. And all the time you're running this five miles, the normal things are going around. How do you look? Are, are you getting any thinner? When you start running two months ago, every time you go past this grammar school when you're running, the kids all go out and say, here comes the blimp. <laughs> are you getting thinner? Are they watching? Or how about that girl that works there in that supermarket or that little 7-Eleven store that keeps kind of looking out? Is she going to be there? All of the ordinary things going on, where? yellow circuit up in here, and we could say even the blue circuit. Well, let's say the yellow circuit because you're daydreaming in words and pictures that require the yellow circuit. But they talk about being able to push yourself. So I'm going ahead with what they say because it is a reflection of something real. Let us say that five miles should be it, and through some quirk, some way you force yourself to run further, what you're doing is you have used up all the energy in here and you start draining down here, which is really outside the normal sphere, this green, in case I... Let me give you an immediate update. Let's call the green area, this jagged area, also is what passes for people's ordinary. So let us say, for whatever reason, you use up all the energy in here, and you begin to run, and they call it such things as, I feel like there's another term I can't think about, or can't think of, but it's like a transcendental experience they have, that they go into a super conscious state, or an extraordinary state of consciousness just through exercise. And it's true. But let me tell you what they're doing. They have used up all the energy here, and now they are getting down into here. And it gets to the point that they let us just use this arbitrary figure I picked out of five miles. That here for the first time you go past that. And it's a feeling like it's a super level of a second wind. It's like a second wind cubed. You then start using energy of a pure nature. You're using energy of a type that is not normally available. And you're no longer wondering what the fuck anybody thinks about you. You're no longer in competition. And they indeed, and they describe it that it's almost as though my mind goes blank. And it's not just running. I'm familiar that people claim this in other fields of exercise. They have touched that, but plus they've also done something else. They have worn out the energy here where the yellow circuit is within this sphere of civilizing influence, and the mind almost goes blank. And they try and describe it that, I'm not even sure, but I just had a general feeling I probably was already, two hours later, that I was probably already up to maybe 15 miles but it's almost as though I couldn't think about it. I, I knew I was running many, many more times further than I ever had, but it was almost as though what little I was thinking, it was like I'd read about people meditating and their mind going blank, and it felt like there I was running, and the wind blowing, the sun shining, and me moving. And I, I never felt so graceful, but it was almost as though I was moving and meditating. They are describing the phenomenon, the basis of it, as I was going to point out, 
is actually of getting in touch with this area that is not within the sphere of blue circuit's influence down here, and of course it does have an effect here. I was going to also try to point you from the other end, up here. When you get into people who write movie scripts, science fiction, for a number of years now, a number of decades, what has been a kind of prime example that they come up with? Now this is just ordinary people, yellow circuit based people, down in here, when they want to really try and exemplify in some material way what would be the, the intellectual, or the type of intellectual. They have consistently come up with what? In one form or another, a disembodied brain that they kept alive in something and they hooked up with wires and it's the brain just sitting there engaged and they say things like engaged in pure reason not limited to the foibles and the weaknesses of the what? The old body. It's just this brain. And when it's in movies it you know, kind of puts off a glow and weird, <laughs> weird music comes on and here it is, these intellectual people with thick glasses and mustaches and tweed coats, and they're standing around in the laboratory there. I don't guess they actually say Harvard, but... <laughs> and they're looking, and they're all sorely amazed and impressed that this is it. And you can see the look of envy in their eyes that, ooh, that's what I'd like to be. <laughs> <laughs> what their genes are driving them to, what they're describing... Of course, that, you can't do that now physically right now. And I'm not saying you ever can. But what are they describing? They're describing a reality. They're describing the area that is outside the sphere of the blue line influence. That that's what that would be. That would be, as opposed to what's going on now, what's possible under ordinary conditions, that would be pure intellectual activity the same way that, if you could get in touch with that, as I'm pointing out to you, that people do get a touch of it, a piece of it, would be relatively speaking, pure red circuit energy and red circuit activity. Can any of you suppose, now that I'm about to make at least a temporary, not a coda, a temporary wrap-up, can any of you suspect that I am right within seconds of pointing out that to do these revolutionary deeds the would-be revolutionist should avoid the blue line sphere of influence like the plague, like a swamp. <laughs> not because there is no place for emotion, not because there is no room for compassion and love and all that, but because there is no place and no room for what everyone else calls compassion and love, because it is a swamp. It is a limiting factor. It is a part of a binary conception of a 3D reality. It is a way station. It is not pure feeling. It is not pure reason. It is necessary for ordinary people. But it is still on a binary basis. It is one circuit through the evolutionary process is one circuit domination over another one who is submitting and you have got the old dance going on internally is why the majority of murders are done amongst what? People what love one another. And who is it that you are the most angry at? Well, the people I'm the closest to. Who, do you, who can you hate best? I know, I know it's very short term, but who can you actually hate best? Well, the people I love, certainly. But let me tell you why. Don't bother, don't bother. I know why. Could you also suspect that I am about to say, since we've talked about health for a while, that from a revolutionary view, the place for real health is there, where there is no talk. Now, you may be unhealthy. You may have been born with half of one lung missing. You may have been born with one leg shorter than the other. You may have been born with a weakness to your spine. All sorts of things. 
you know, so what? I'm sure it's sad. We all got our problems. But that's a given. But now we're talking about this. Given your condition as it is, can you suspect that what I keep saying that health is not a hobby? Down here is where you could be as healthy as you can be, but that part can't talk. And that part, you cannot show it. Hey, look here. Here's some more new information about drinking fish oil will keep your cholesterol down. Down in here, it knows nothing about cholesterol, got no interest in cholesterol. If it had a sense of humor, you know what it would think about you trying to show it? You know, the newest thing out of Reader's Digest, hey, read this, I am Joe's colon and what it says we should do. We should. <laughs> if this thing had a separate identity, if it had a separate consciousness, it would understand that, hey, you people up there, you're making me as sick as anything. Forget, forget smoking and drinking ham and eating hamburgers and eating too much ice cream. It's the kind of shit you're doing upstairs that's really making me sick. If you'd leave me alone, I'd be as well as I could be. And there'd be no talk about it. Also, there is a parallel arrangement up here that this would be the place that astounding intellectual activity be possible. And I say astounding, I'm not trying to say anything of any great mystical nature. This would be the place that lateral expansion of the nervous system would take place. It would not be limited to all the binary information here. It would not be limited to the first stories that life. You know, last time we met, I was talking about the first stories that life put out. You also understand that life didn't put it out. All right, life puts it out. But how does it put it out? Through your own nervous system. So your own consciousness is as much responsible as life is. But it would be being able to take all of the numerous first stories you have ever had, all the numerous conflicts of information, diverse opinions, and up here it could rectify them all because it could take all first stories, it could take all conflicting ideas and opinions and see them from a new vantage point and to see that they were not in conflict, that there is nothing in life diametrically opposed to anything else. It is only in limited consciousness that there is such a apparent diametrical standoff between this opinion, that opinion, this fact, and that fact. Semi-new paragraph. There is a I guess it qualifies as a scientific theory. I keep running across it, and I heard it mentioned again today. There's some British biologist, I believe he was, in the last four or five years has gotten some publicity that his theory is that it's basically this. He seems hesitant. Every time I hear him mention, he is very defensive because somebody, some other scientist attacks him with this. He's very defensive, and he keeps hedging, he doesn't want to say that planet Earth is alive, which I've already told you that. But the theory is that the planet is almost, oh, well, it's kind of, it's sort of, unless you ask me directly, says he, it's sort of alive on this basis that he suspects or he theorizes that evolution is not as lineal in the direction that has been assumed over the last few decades. That is that humanity has evolved fashioning itself in response to the environment, as though you know, there isn't out there, but rather that perhaps that is what? Backwards. That what is going on is that living organisms, primarily humanity, has helped reshape the environment itself, the planet, so that it will be more hospitable to life. And he seems to base this, or his reasoning seems to spring from him it was no secret, but him taking such information as uh, the temperature of the oceans, how that has uh, finally a demonstrative effect on the temperature, the depth of the biosphere around this planet. The growth of algae in the oceans controls the temperature of the oceans, and the temperature of the oceans 
controls the amount of rainfalls in certain places, and the rainfall affects the biosphere. And so if it changed just a few degrees over a period of time, weeks or months, we'd all be done for. All right, that's the theory. He even has a name for it, which I forgot. But it's been a theory, and it keeps popping up, and I keep hearing about it. And every time it pops up, then another scientist. The reason I brought it up, since it happened today, and all of us ministers always use those good examples, since a woman didn't walk up to me today and say, Rabbi so-and-so, so I use this. Came off the news. For some reason, he's shown back up, and now another famous scientist. Not even heard of this one. Famous scientist, he says that he has considered this guy's theories for the oldest number of years. He's listened to the arguments. And he doesn't mind new theories coming out in the scientific community, even if they're erroneous, because it always spurs conversation, debate. But, be that as it may, said this famous scientist in rebuttal, he said, be that as it may, this theory is fallacious from the word go, and here's why. He says, although he understands, and he was familiar with, the way that Temperatures of the ocean affect the biosphere and how it controls human life. In other words, kind of the interplay of the food chain. Be that as it may, says he, the rest of the theory is no good because there is not one iota, and I'm almost quoting what they gave on the radio, that there is not one iota, one shred of proof that humans, humans have done the least thing to make this planet more hospitable to life. <laughs> now, is that a first story or not? Well, look at your own nervous system. If it wasn't for my bad influence on some of you, as soon as you heard that, you'd go, that's true. And you'd have all these flashes through your yellow circuits about toxic waste, atomic bombs, garbage in the street. But is, talk about a first story. But it sounds right to many people. And that was the end of their little comment today on the radio about this particular problem because this famous guy points out there may be undoubtedly these connections between the growth rate of algae in our oceans and the temperature of this planet and the overall greenhouse effect and whether human life and other life survives. Yeah, yeah, all right. But to say that humans in some way are participating in their own evolution and participating in the evolution of the planet that is, make it more hospitable? Ha! You know, you're nuts. There's not one shred of evidence. And many people go, yeah, that's true. That takes care of that theory. For me to be facetious here for a second, am I going to say, is that man blind? Has he been locked in a closet and just got a reputation as being a famous scientist? Does that mean, how did he get that reputation? The man doesn't even read the papers. The man doesn't realize that the lifespan between you and your grandparents, or what? It's increased, what, 30%? In your lifetime. And yet the story would strike many people. It struck the people doing this report on the radio. They used him as the climax of the little article. That, well, humans, obviously, no shred whatsoever. Don't make me laugh. They have done nothing to make this place more hospitable. Is the man blind? Have we got that man's nervous system still walking around? They're not even that far up to date that even a world-famous scientist, at the very least, is what, 50 years behind? He hasn't noticed? He hasn't noticed at all that if we're going to use their descriptions to notice that humans have done just more things that I won't talk about if we're going to take the basis of their story, their description, that is the humans doing it. It is a wonderful example of first story because it seems true. And it is blatantly untrue to take just their conception of the story, of the argument, of the theory, that humans either can and are participating in manipulating the environment and making this a more hospitable place to live, or, according to the world-famous scientists, don't make me laugh. They haven't done anything contrary. In the contrary part, it just strikes people. It still strikes people of, yeah, 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 that's true. We're just fucking it all up. And you've got to be blind. That is, you've got to be ordinary. You have got to be living in the confines of this. 
whereas it's all first story, whereas it's all slow information, it's all flawed information. I will remind you I am not a preacher. I am not here to try to convince you of anything. But what I, raising my voice and waving my hands and drawing diagrams, is part of the entertainment, is part of the body blows of trying to soften you up for you to realize that if left to your own devices, and if you heard the theory of humans participating in making our planet, our part of the solar system, a more hospitable place to live, you heard that, you had it a second, and then you heard, uh, but another famous scientist come right along and says, that's ridiculous. That's silly. And you'd suddenly realize, most of you, well, that's true, because he points out there is not one shred of evidence, not one that humans have done anything to make this more hospitable. And of course the tacit part is that they didn't even include is like contraire. We're about to kill everything, destroy everything. We've made it worse. And you got to be blind. You got to be an idiot. That is, you got to be ordinary. To buy the first story. But I want you to see that your nervous system, by and large, is already wired up. And it's not from your background. It's worldwide. You're wired up to believe that the flood's coming. That God is around a fruit tree and amen, he's going to jump out and he says, I told you people not to eat that. Or that humans are suddenly going to go into some spasm of greater insanity and both here and other parts of the world mice the button and the doomsday machine go off. Just remember this though. There is a basis for that fear. And what is it? Everybody wants to shuffle their feet and look off. The, the basis is, well, I'm going to die. And if I'm going to die, hell, everybody's going to die. <laughs> if I'm going to die, life's going to die. If I'm going to die and I'm no longer conscious, if I'm not here, everything's gone. So you might as well believe that destruction is around the corner. Everything's going to be gone. Because if, if you're present, binary consciousness of reality, and you is all you've got, and you go and you look at your Uncle Fred laying there in the casket, and you try your best for the yellow circuit down within the sphere of that influence, what is death? You know, I'll lay down, and it's like going to sleep, but I won't have any dreams, and I'll never wake up. In other words, the only thing you can come up with is almost an idea, if you've got that kind of yellow circuit, of non-existent existence. <laughs> so in other words, if I'm not conscious of being here, there probably is not going to be any here. There might as well be destruction. At any rate, that's not important, but I was going to point out that there is, as always, a basis for all kinds of childish beliefs, such as everything's going to come apart and be destroyed. Right, because you are. So it's safe enough for you to go ahead with the feeling that everything is going downhill. Right, because you are. Everything's coming apart. Yes, because you are. Things are not as healthy and as good as they were in days gone by. Like when I was younger, life was a lot better. People were more decent. They, they loved healthier lives. Yeah, 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 yeah. All you're saying is, I'm not as young as I used to be. All you're saying is, I'm closer to the doomsday machine. I'm closer to dying. And everybody wants to shuffle and look sad. I just want you to see, I'm trying to get you to see the difference that the nervous system is wired up in such a way, now it's just between you and I, this is not to life, but it's wired up in such a way that you'll believe almost any piece of goddamn shit that'll come along. <laughs> See, there I go trying to get your attention again. You're wired up. You don't have any choice if you live in that sphere of hearing that humanity is making this planet more inhospitable. And everything in you, from top to bottom, that can participate in any kind of conscious reaction to that goes, yeah. Yeah. And it's not true. And a few people can see it. But, well, that's just, it's obviously not true. And I was trying to point out one of the obvious ones, one of the very simple ones, that here in the United States, I'm not a statistician, but if I remember the, like the turn of the century, Shortly after the Civil War, less, within the last hundred years, wasn't the lifespan in America something like 38? 
I'm not far off. That was the average lifespan. And what is it now? As long as most people want to live. <laughs> and you've got to just be absolutely blind to that or else be able to discount it, which in the city they can. Where they can mumble and stroke their beard and wander off. It just doesn't arise. But to say we are about to pollute our nest to the point we're going to destroy the planet. That if anything, humans have made it more inhospitable. And the whole chorus of nervous systems in the city goes, yes, 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 yes. When it's something as simple as I'm pointing out. And I'm just using their figures. So within a hundred years, the lifespan is more than doubled. There's nothing you can do with it. Ordinary people can't even hear it. They can't do both at once. Both of them can't be true. It's irrelevant. It's meaningless. And plus, they're too busy. That's the way it's supposed to be. Speaking of the news, there's two or three more. One that I mentioned a while back, but some of you haven't heard it. Uh, Right up to date. If you recall, once I was mentioning recently about fad facts that human consciousness also, this is off in a strange direction, but you'll be able to hear some of it, is wired up to believe that in some way that there's this gradual unfolding process of the truth. Little pieces of it. In the last seven or eight years, I assume all of you have read as much as I did in the common media that psychologists and physiologists and medicine came up with some types of people. They started off with businessmen, I think, and they called them type A's. There were people who were very aggressive. The real successful business men and women out in life, they started out, I think, with men, since they got the best ulcers. <laughs> but they called them type A. They did observations made all the medical journals, became an accepted fact seven or eight, ten years ago that type A people, statistically, with some great figure, were 50% more likely to suffer heart attacks and strokes than whatever the other type B, people who were more laid back, people who did not get, take life that seriously and did not seem to display that kind of stressful reaction to life. That's been an accepted fact now for eight or ten years. There's no doubt about it. Too much statistical proof. But now, just in the last two or three or four weeks, they have noticed this, and it's now an accepted fact, that those who suffer heart attacks and strokes and are the type A are more likely to recover. Think about that a second. <laughs> Now, in the city, there's nothing to think about. Nobody, I heard that on the news. Somebody there on the news, a Dan Rather, somebody said right there and read that, and they flashed up some kind of graphics, or had some doctor who gave the figures, and not one person. I kept waiting, fool that I am. I kept waiting for somebody to go, what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Or to at least smile to say, now they say that the type A's are much more likely to recover. Not a smile, not a grin. You know why? Because within this realm, within this sphere of the blue line, there is no humor. <laughs> it's only in there that people laugh, and I've already pointed out to you, it's only in there that people laugh, and the only kind of humor they know is hostility. They can't laugh over the fact of, hey, we've been had. They can't laugh over the fact that, hey, if this is true, that can't be true, and to get outside that and realize, yeah, it can. <laughs> but see, there's no hostility there. But how about that? And see, I'm not arguing with that. You people, even you newer people, I hope you beginning, well, that's hard for me to say to understand that I am not laughing, or I'm not questioning either one. It takes you a while, not just to get used to me, but to get used to thinking and feeling a certain new way yourself by attempting to. I am not saying either one's wrong. I'm not questioning whatsoever. Not at all. If they say that they describe type A, I knew what they meant. I knew what they thought they were observing. It was a fair description they made in the city that this type of personality will call type A, and they're very prone to be stressful. 
be driven. I understand that. They say that they are blank percentage more likely to have a stroke. I'm not saying that it's not true. I'm not hinting otherwise. I accept it. Now they say if you have a stroke, if you have a heart attack, you are X amount percentage more likely to recover if you're type A than the type that's kind of laid back, the type B or whatever the other one is. But now think about it. That if, according to the city, and I'm not questioning it, remember that. Let's assume they're both true. I do. I got no complaint with it. That if you're type A, that's their name. They've taken a process and put a name on it. They've nouned it. They've classified it. They can observe people, many people. They say, are you type A? Once they describe it, maybe people go, yeah, you got me. I am. <laughs> right? They say, all right, you are 52% more likely to have a heart attack and a stroke. And they go, I'm not surprised to hear it. <laughs> then you wait a beat. You wait a measure. You say, all right, all of you people in hospitals under doctor's care who's had a heart attack or a stroke, you've got a 52% better chance of full recovery if you're a type A person. And nobody says, wait a minute, if I'm type A, I'm going to get a heart attack. But if I get one from being a type A, I'm more likely to recover. To put it very crudely, if not succinctly, it will not compute. You just can't deal with both. One was a fact, and now it's gradually becoming a non-fact. And just because it's no longer true doesn't stop it from actually being in currency in the city. And it's a gradual process, but you can't have both. An ordinary person cannot deal with both of those facts at the same time. And in the city, there are facts. It's a life putting out a new first story, and the nervous system cannot adjust to it simultaneously. It cannot see that this is, can exist coevally. Another one that goes on all the time, if you can see, since we've got only a few minutes on this side of the tape, I will stretch it right quick. How about everybody's heard this? It came into common verbal currency back in the 60s, but the idea had been around for years about you are what you eat. That's a great first story you hear it, and you think, yeah. In that jagged area of your personality, city consciousness that hey, that's got to be true that in fact you get healthier you remember the 60s some of you some of you you remember it don't you well it was in all the papers even if you were kind of <laughs> if you were drugged out with the feeling all these good hippie type people now in here not down in here but in here like hey i want to reach some kind of transcendental state or be more conscious i know what i'll do i'll give up those goddamn hamburgers and donuts and eat bean sprouts because it's got to be healthier, and their you know, whole philosophy seemed to be tied to it. It sounds like a great story. It just sounds like obviously true that you are what you eat. No. Oh. And the, pr the proof is everywhere. Now, what I'm going to say is not really the absolute correctness of it, but as opposed to you are what you eat, uh uh. What you eat are you. The proof of it is everywhere. Except that is not life's present first story. No matter what you eat, it's not going to change you. Whatever you eat becomes what you already are. That's why there is no ambrosia. There is no food of the gods. You cannot change. You cannot change down in here what you eat. You are a mad, let's just use shorthand right quick. You're a mad, narrow-minded, uh, Overweight from eating, I don't mean genetically, but overweight from eating, uh, dunderhead. <laughs> you, eat, you eat a McDonald's, and it becomes part of a hostile, overweight, non-genetically, narrow-minded dunderhead. You eat bean sprouts, the bean sprouts become what? <laughs> they become part of a narrow-minded, overweight, not genetically, hostile dunderhead. Anything a tiger eats becomes tiger. That's all it can do. If a tiger eats a hamburger, if it eats a possum, if it eats a wild dog, it gets into the system, and that wild dog, that possum, becomes what? It becomes part of a tiger. The tiger does not become a possum. I'm not playing with words. I'm telling you a fact. You are not what you eat. When I say the proof is all around you, why can't people lose weight? Why can't people quit drinking? Why do people want to drink, certain people? Why can certain people apparently take up drinking alcohol and become, as they call it, alcoholics. And they now 
more correctly than they used to. It's not the answer, but they now more correctly refer to it as an illness rather than some character weakness. But why is it that that affects some people and it doesn't others? Some people can drink socially all their life, 30 years. And suddenly a doctor or somebody says, uh, quit drinking. They say, okay, and that's the end of it. Why is it that there is no rhyme or reason for what seems to be people's diet, you know, all the way from food to alcohol to kinds of drugs to the environment? Why is it some people can get by with murder the way they treat themselves, apparently physically, and live to be 80? And other people seem to be so weak. And you can go and look in their drug cabinets and they got every drug known to man right up to date and they still always seem that they're on the verge of tottering into a grave, an open pit. <laughs> the truth is, when it gets to what is real health and when it gets to real intellectual activity, the real yellow circuit, what goes in here is not going to change the rest of it. If the tiger eats possum, the possum becomes tiger, not vice versa. This is not limited to food. This is not limited to material, physical reality. Now take it into that which seems to be the unique world of man's feelings and intellect. If you are what you eat, then why is it you can't pick up? They, they, everybody says in the city that they're great books, they're great thoughts, they're great spiritual, intellectual works of art. If that's so, why can't you get the dialogues of Plato, the collected works of Aristotle, Gerder, the Bhagavad Gita, and you read it <laughs> and just be staggered by it and be changed that you take in that food and you are what you eat. And it doesn't happen. You've got to be an idiot. You've already tried it. By the same token, you should be thankful because you can read true romances <laughs> with a nice... <laughs> I see you understand some of it. <laughs> you should be thankful that that does not become part of you, or that you can sit there and watch sitcoms on television. It just goes in, and they go through you like duck, you know, like pork goes through a duck. What you eat does not become you. What you eat, I mean, what you don't become what you eat, what it becomes you. It would ordinarily be referred to as, when we get into the area of ideas as opposed to material food, is these great thoughts, these great ideas, these great works of literature, these great spiritual truisms. You eat them, but you don't become them. They become you. Somebody says, read this book, it'll change your life. Or your own DNA, the history of man, says, all right, these particular works, the Bible, the Old Testament, the Quran, will change you, will shake your very foundations. And you get it and you read it, <laughs> but it is filtered through you. It becomes you. It becomes, you already got your opinions, you already wired up a certain way. You are not what you eat. As opposed to that, it's vice versa. But look what a beautiful story. It appears, it sounds to be true. I'm going to stop so that they the group can do some more. We're going to try this for a little while longer. You should be getting something from this. I know when I decided to do this, uh, the older group, somebody mentioned this to take some of the pressure because some of you may already feel this, and so I'll put the words in your brain for you. I didn't say this. Somebody else did. When I told them, well, you new people, if we're going to meet several nights a week, I'm going to let you have one of the nights to present, or at least part of one of the nights. And they thought about it. Well, it wasn't a request. I just told them they was going to do it, but we were sitting around, and several people thought, and then one person says, well, I said, they may have enjoyed us thus far. <laughs> so but once you see James Brown in person, are you ever going to be satisfied you know, to watch the warm-up for just a band come out in the, you know, the first hour before the main act shows up? Can we go back and them enjoy just hearing the JBs? That was James Brown, his band. Now, they were great if you like that kind of stuff. But it's, I understand, it's not really the same as when they say, it's showtime, are you ready for the hardest working man in showbiz? J.B. himself. So don't any of you feel bad. We'll see, you should be getting something in a slightly different way, being filtered through these people. 
have another excursion on top of everything else for your new people. For the next five days, I want you to do something. Now listen, I'm not going to tell you anything other than to do it. I'm going to describe it, and you can do it. When you lay down and you go to sleep, and you got to try to run this up, you'll find out how to do it yourself. As close as you can, just when you go to sleep, I want you to have a thought, a thought you can describe. It doesn't matter what, like, I will smile in the morning, or the news says it will rain tomorrow, or tomorrow is Wednesday. Tomorrow is Wednesday. And say it several times. That there's got to be a thought, a sentence. And what I want you to do is as soon as you wake up in the morning, as soon as you wake up, is to yourself have that same thought. If it's going to be, let's say, tomorrow is Wednesday, tomorrow is Wednesday, and you go to sleep, and seven, eight, nine hours later, as soon as you wake up, just as soon as you do, I want you to make yourself, I want you to do this, that the first thing that runs through your yellow circuit up there is tomorrow is Wednesday. Word for word, exactly, I want you to pick up that one short sentence, just something that simple, my name is Joe. <laughs> word for word, literally, as soon as you awaken, I want you to find out that you can do it, and I'm not going to tell you anything else. Uh, and from last time when I was mentioning to you about that you should be giving yourself some sort of freedom favor, I feel rather confident that all of you are not convinced that you under even understood what I was talking about. But to give yourself the freedom from something something had been bugging you for whatever reason. We're not going into why. I know why. You were born in the city. And everybody does stuff that bugs you. Everybody's off balance. Everybody seems flawed. That's the way you're supposed to be. But I wanted you to pick out something that you could handle, something that you could absolutely put up a note and to see if you could not understand what it was to have some real integrity to put up a goddamn stupid stick-on note saying, I will not do so-and-so. I will not eat pizza after 10 o'clock. And that's it and never do it again. A, a variation of this, there's always an order, is to do something that may seem to be fairly irrelevant to you. If you can't handle, if you can't seem to get started with doing that, which would really seem to be something that had been bugging you. For instance, uh, if you do drink coffee and you've had it with cream all your life, it simply stop drinking it with cream. No matter how you say it tastes and all that, this is not a big chore. If it is, don't come back. Good grief. <laughs> but it's pick out something fairly irrelevant. Or, uh, you know, pick out something that you're going to, let's assume that right now you can't do but two push-ups. Men or women is decide that you are going to, first thing in the morning, until you can get to where you can do it, they're going to start practicing push-ups until the first thing when you pop out of bed, you can fall down and do 25 push-ups. No discretion. Uh, you're not going to tell anybody. You don't get a star. I'll never know it. Nobody will ever know it. There's no reason for it. It won't do you any good in life. <laughs> but it's something you can do. It's something you can do if you do it every morning. If you can only do two now, a week from now, you can do 10. Two weeks from now, you can probably do 12, 15. It can be done. But if you say, well, all right, I'll try some coffee without cream, and you go, ugh. Now I remember 20 years ago when I first tried it, that's why I put cream in it, because without cream it tastes like, ugh. Drink it another day, two days, and you'll forget about it. In other words, it is fairly irrelevant to you. It may not be bugging you, but pick out something that seems to be fairly irrelevant. As I said, I don't like to give punchlines. I don't normally do excursions, but how about this? Everything that goes on in here, you're going to find out to these untouched areas to where I'm trying to drag you. All of that's irrelevant. It's just right now you still think it's serious. You know, whether you, whether you have cream, whether you have cream in your coffee, or whether God is Jewish or not. I mean, that kind of serious shit. 